a sure foundation. The one who believes will be unshakable. He will be the sure foundation for his time, a rich store of salvation and the present in knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the key to this treasure. Lord, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Faithful love and truth go before. Hey, I 
Jesus to man the post hole diggers and the screw guns. So if you're able to do that, 7.30 at the camp, it's your local, and it'll be a great blessing uh, to those in need and also to those that are able to help. Don't forget tonight, 6 o'clock at the camp, our ID camp, that's an opportunity for us to minister to our young people. We look forward to that. And then on Thursday nights, our 7 p.m. Bible study, that is a work in progress. And we're probably going to be making some adjustments to that. So stay tuned, and we'll let you know about that. Next Friday and Saturday, we'll be having a community yard sale at the camp. Uh, just a way to continue to raise a little bit of money for that project and for us to get rid of some things that we don't need, but somebody else desperately does. You can bring those items by the camp throughout the week. Text me, call me, and I'll meet you there. And then share with your friends. Come to the camp and uh, help us next Friday and Saturday um, do that. And then don't forget, next Sunday morning is a time that we've been praying about and looking forward to, um, God and Country Day. We're pulling out all the stops, and we're going to make sure we take all the precautions for social distancing and safety. Uh, but we're going to have patriotic music, a patriotic message by Lieutenant Governor Dan Marsh. I keep thinking about Amy Griffith when Barney was so excited. The governor is coming here to shake my hand. And so the Lieutenant Governor is coming, and uh, we hope you have the opportunity to be here. And also through Facebook Live to hear his testimony. You will be blessed. He's a great man of God and a dear friend. He was uh, our host, one of our hosts that took Tiffany and me to Israel last year. And we want to return that favor for you. So next January, all into the first part of February, we'll be going to Israel. There's some information in your bulletin and some flyers in the back on the table and also on our website. And you can check that out. Listen, you might say, well, isn't it kind of dangerous to go to Israel? I begin telling people, a study recently came out that Israel is the third safest place on the planet to visit. America ranks number 58. So y'all, let's go someplace safe for a week, okay? It'll be a blessing and the Bible will come alive before your eyes. Baptism service Sunday, August the 2nd. See me uh, about that. And we're so excited about that. That's going to be a wonderful day. And then on August the 9th, Ivan Parker will be here. I want to encourage you to pray for folks like Ivan. And last year we had the Wisdoms and Karen Peck and, and others. These folks are unemployed right now. These people who travel and sing and do gospel concerts are literally at home. Uh, they're not able to travel. The churches are meeting and gathering and having concerts. So I hope you'll come and support that event. We'll, again, make sure we have plenty of social distancing here in this building. Uh, but pray for Ivan and people just like him uh, that are struggling these days to keep their ministries uh, going through this turbulent time. Well, you'll notice on the back of your bulletin a couple of um, special things coming up. Our men's prayer breakfast on August the 1st. Camp cleanup. Thank you for the way so many come out and help us uh, get the camp turned around for the next group that comes. We'll have folks coming in this afternoon and uh, hopefully uh, be a great week there for them. I uh, would let you know our total offering last week was roughly $125,000. That's pretty amazing. And so we had this little board uh, drawn up at the beginning of our 419 challenge and we were able to complete that. And so we give God all the glory for that. When I drew that little board up, I thought, You know every deal. You know the uh, you know the serial number on every deal and where they are and where they're going to come from. And I'm thankful God truly uh, kept His word as He always does because He provided our need according to His riches and glory. But thank you for participating and being a part of all of that. As we go to the morning prayer, I wouldn't begin trying to mention all the prayer needs. But every person in this room and every person on Facebook this morning, you have folks in your family that you are praying for, that you're lifting up, people going through uh, physical issues, battling cancer and other diseases, uh, even battling the COVID uh, epidemic. And many folks out there struggling with that and trying to protect themselves from that. Uh, we certainly want to pray for those with spiritual needs, emotional, financial, and we want to pray for our nation. Next Sunday we're going to be talking a lot about that. But there's only one group of people that the Bible says, I'm holding you accountable for the family and for the government. And it is the Christian. We have a great responsibility to pray and to live according to God's word and to be light in the midst of darkness. So we pray together for that. I appreciate you joining me every morning. 
uh, on our sunrise devotion. God's been giving us some beautiful sunrises. If you've not checked those out, go on to the Lake Church Facebook page, watch those videos, and share them. I talked with a dear lady in West Virginia this week. She said, I get up every morning and watch the sunrise at White Lake, and I can't wait to come in person and experience it. So you just never know how God will use these days and a little five to ten minute devotion every morning to touch somebody's heart more humble and go on and share that, share the videos and the other opportunities. Don't forget some things in the back to let people know that the Lake Church, that there are bright and shining days ahead of us with the other shirts that are in. And Emily keeps on pumping out these little uh, cups and different things and we're so blessed and her gift to the church that we're able to pass on to you. And uh, we're just excited. Listen, we're going to take up an offering in a minute. Are you excited about that? Well, you ought to be, y'all. It's the best investment you could possibly make because it will have an eternal dividend. And we're thankful. We've got some new offering envelopes, and so we need to explain them to you. Since we did check off the uh, camp challenge last week and the uh, market paid in full, the offering envelopes say three things. Church tithes. That's our responsibility. God's called us not to be thieves, but to be faithful. The first tenth of everything that we have, and not only belongs to Him, 100% of all that we have belongs to Him, but He requires us the first 10%. The second line says camp offering. These are the offerings that help with the ongoing ministry down at the camp. Um, we had to return much of what had come in this year because of groups not being able to come. It's a great ministry. It's a powerful testimony. So anytime you feel led to help, that's that. And then thirdly, the building fund. This is actually to help fund the building of the new worship center. I will let you know that not only did God bless us to pay off a $1.6 million debt, but He's also put forth about a half a million dollars in a building fund, and it's growing. So participate in that, and then under that says other, and that's for if you feel led to help financially with something like the ramp project or another mission that's on your heart, you can fill that out. So didn't want to take a lot of time, but those things can be a bit confusing, and we want you to know how to use those offering envelopes. So you got a lesson this morning. Let's go to the morning prayer as we continue in worship. I want to ask you to stand as we honor the very presence of God this morning. I am thankful to know that where two or three are gathered, there He, the King of kings and Lord of lords, is in the midst. And listen, there's no stipulation that that doesn't include those watching at home on Facebook. The presence of the Holy Spirit may yet feel where you are. Father, thank you for the presence of God. Thank you for the power of God. Thank you for, for not only the all the things that you provide us, but for the person that you are. You are our personal Savior. You are our sustainer. Oh, Holy Spirit, you interpret the groanings of our heart to the ear of an almighty and holy God. Father, we come before you a people that are in great need, but we come into the presence of one who ministers with great bounty. God, fill this place. Every worshiper here at the venue and at home on Facebook God, may they sense your presence in a way like never, ever, ever before. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. After we sing the next song, the ushers will come, pass an altar plate. You participate and watch God bless the King. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my keeper. My God is my rock, in whom I take refuge. My shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Psalm 18, 2. Messiah, my Savior, there is power in your name. You're my rock and my redeemer. There is no other name like Jesus. And we've sung this song before, and I don't know if it's familiar to you or not, but we really don't say anything here at the Lake Church that is not straight out of Scripture. So even if you don't know the tune of this song this morning, I pray that you will read the words and let it be a prayer, a praise, a thanksgiving, an adoration for our Savior, Jesus Christ. There is a true Yeah. 
remember the song. Something like that will get stuck in your head, y'all. Forty years and still stuck in my head. All right, this morning, there's a twofold application of this text, and we're going to move through it quickly. Number one, there is the personal application that you and I are building our lives. The younger you are, it's good news that you get to hear this message early on. But for some of us that are middle-aged and for those that are older, you might look back and say, I wish I would have built my house or my life a little differently. There's good news that HGTV did not invent the idea of a remodel or a renovation, but God did. He wants to renovate your life. He wants to give you a firm foundation. You can't change the past, but from this point forward, you can make sure that that what you do is built on a solid foundation. Fact is, around White Lake, there's a lot of holes that have discovered after being built 10, 20, 30, or 40 years that they've got some issues. But praise God, you can jack them up, fix the foundation, and move on. So some of us today need to do that. And we need to trust God that the days ahead will be built on a more solid foundation than the days that are behind us. But secondly, the application is not only personal, but it is corporate. That is for the church. Here's kingdom work. There are many situations out there today where we see churches, and I mentioned earlier, denominations and religious movements that maybe once upon a time had the right foundation. But over the years, that foundation has changed. It shifted. We'll talk about that. Other times you go back and you say, well, you know, the very foundation upon which that church was built was in error. I, I think, and I thank God, that the late church was birthed out of vision. Listen, wake up. It was birthed out of vision, not out of Division. If that makes sense, say amen. amen. There's a lot of churches out there that have been birthed out of division. And God can bless those at times and God's used those. But I'm thankful that the very beginning, April 20th, 2014, this church began and was birthed out of a vision that I have no doubt was directly from God for such a time as this. I want to give you three things to consider this morning. When we look at the tale of two foundations. Now the song has told us, the scriptures told us, there's the foundation of the wise man and the foundation of the foolish man. The solid foundation and the sinking foundation. You understand that. But we need to dig just a little bit deeper and understand what is under that foundation. Before you pour the foundation or before you pour the footers and lay the block and begin building the structure, it's important that you dig down deep, Brother Charlie, and make sure you've got something solid upon which to lay that foundation. Amen? So let me just give you one thing to begin with. Number one, the requirements of our Lord. God does not say, hey, y'all, go build a church. Hey, y'all, go build a life. Hey, y'all, go build a family. Hey, y'all, go build a country. But He says, wait, let's make sure we've dug in deep. we found something solid upon which to pour those footings and to lay that foundation. Two requirements. Number one, the experience of salvation. Remember I mentioned a moment ago the word therefore in verse number 24. And I told you I would explain what it's there for. So let's jump back three verses to verse number 21. Jesus says, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that which doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, for many will say unto me in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Didn't we preach a good message, God? Lord, and in your name we've cast out devils. We've done things that certainly only you could have accomplished. And in your name done many wonderful works. God, look at all the acts of benevolence and charity we've done. And the Bible says, Then Jesus will profess unto them. Jesus says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. 
And then the scripture says, therefore, I will liken it to the foolish and wise man. So we need to understand that salvation must be at the very initial stages of our life, of the church, and of everything we do. If we don't get that part right, everything else will perish. You can't be good enough. You can't do enough good deeds. There must be a relationship with the Lord, an encounter through the Holy Spirit of God with the Holy God to where He wipes your sin debt away, places paid in full upon your life, and then that that's been taken care of, then you can begin building. Now we've got some things to do down at the camp before we um, start working on the building. I'm looking forward to seeing the, you know, the, the slab poured and the building begin to go up and, and everything coming together. But step one, we've got to take some soil samples and go in there and dig out until we've got something solid and bring in some good solid earth and make sure that all of that is right. Because it doesn't, listen, it doesn't matter how beautiful everything is on the outside. If it's not right underneath, it will not stand the test of time. Salvation must be the first step in building our life. Whether I want to be a good husband, a good father, whether I want to be a good person, I can attempt everything in my power, but I've got a sin debt hanging upon me. I've got a broken relationship with the Holy God because of my sinfulness. There's something that will always hold me back. Number two, not only the experience of salvation, but secondly, the expression of sanctification. Now, I know we've got some Pentecostals in here today, and I grew up kind of Pentecostal Baptist, a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but everybody's got a different idea about what sanctification is. Now, I grew up thinking that sanctification looked a certain way. You know, if you were sanctified, ladies, you didn't wear makeup, Lord knows you didn't wear bridges. If you were sanctified, you didn't go to the movie theater and you didn't read magazines. Uh, you know, if you were sanctified, you didn't play cards, you didn't even play checkers. Bless God, if you were sanctified, you didn't go to the beach, but you could go to the coast. I didn't quite understand a lot about it, but I thought I had a pretty good grip on being sanctified, that if you could have any old thing going going on in here, but as long as you put on a good act, it was okay. That's not sanctification, y'all. That's playing dress up. That's playing pretend. That's like something little boys and little girls do when they act like something they're not. And the most miserable person is the person that's trying to be sanctified without ever being saved. So salvation is in place. And by the way, there's only one way to be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. It's not narrow-minded, it's the narrow way. I'm thankful, listen. You say, well, don't you wish there was more ways to heaven, friend? I'm just thankful there's one way to heaven because I didn't deserve it. But sanctification is when we humble ourselves, we empty ourselves, and we say, oh God, in and of me I can do nothing, but through you I can do all things. God, I want a heart that is pure. I want a mind that is clear. I want a light that is above reproach. I don't want to go to bed at night feeling guilty because I've been everybody but you, fool. God, I want to truly, as, as Paul said in Romans 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you would present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. It's not about me impressing my neighbor. It's not about me outliving my peers. It's not about me making a good show so people will say, Atta boy. But it's about me laying everything at the foot of the cross so they might say, Atta Savior. Look when I see Him and I hear Him and I'm around Him, I feel as though I'm closer to God. Oh friend, when we think about building a life, salvation and then this righteous pursuit of sanctification, well, how do you know when you get sanctified? Friend, I want to tell you, the word sanctified has no past tense. I pray that with my last fleeting breath, I am just a little more sanctified than I was the moment before. That every day, yes, it's sweeter with Jesus, but every day I just get a little bit closer to Him. I become a little less like my old self and a little more like Him as I prepare for glory. 
Well, let's move real quick. That's the requirements of our Lord. In other words, we don't build on our own terms. We build on His. Well, give me one little last illustration. Whenever we dig down here for the building and we get everything in place, do you know we're going to have an inspection? The building, uh, you know, division in Blayton County, inspectors are going to come out and they're going to say, here is our requirement. A certain depth, a certain soil test, a certain distance away from the water and all these things. Imagine if we say, hey buddy, I respect your credentials. And, and, and we have great respect for your criteria. And your rules are awesome and good. I'm sure they were well thought out. But hey, we're just going to build it on our own terms. We're just going to have our own set of standards. We're just going to do our thing our way. Hey, but I hope it's all right with you. How long do you reckon that would work? But when we come to God and say, God, we're going to serve you, but we're going to serve you on our, on our terms. God, I'm going to build a life, but I'm going to build it on my terms. Well, we need to move. Number two, there's the reality of our lives. You with me? Say amen. Oh, whoa. Two of you. Wake up everybody else. Number one, the requirements. But number two, the realities of our life. I've got to tell you something, friend. I don't know what kind of preachers you've been listening to. I don't know what kind of books you've been getting over at the Walmarts. I don't know what kind of spiritual guidance you've been gotten, you, you, that, that you've been given. But if you believe that Christianity makes you immune from the storms of life, you've been sold a false bill of goods. May I say to you, the Bible says that as the days of Christ would approach, as the return of the Lord Jesus, it would be more um, important and more imperative that the church shine as lights in the midst of darkness. Why? Because we would be thrown into the midst of a crooked and a perverse generation. We understand that we are in a storm these days. When you turn on the television or you look at the news or you look at the web news and things and you just think, my goodness, what days we're living in. Let me tell you, storms come even into the lives of the most godly people. In fact, and I don't understand it, and God doesn't know me an explanation, but some of the most godly people I know have had to face some of the most difficult challenges I can imagine. Some of you are watching today, and you know who you are. And you've been through storms, and we've watched you weather those storms, and your testimony has shown brightly, and you've won more people to the Lord, and how you've handled these storms that we will ever know this side of eternity. And many of you that are gathered here, you, you're either in a storm, you've just come out of a storm, or there's a storm a coming. Let me give you a couple of things. Number one, the reality of our lives, the Savior, He is no respecter of persons. Verse 24, Jesus says, therefore, here it is, whosoever hears the sayings of mine, and then builds his house on the rock. The word whosoever is one of my favorite words in all of the scripture because that's who I am. I am a whosoever that Jesus was willing to die for. I am a whosoever that Jesus was willing to go to death, hell, and the grave to rescue and to redeem. And Jesus is saying, here's the thing. Everybody, listen to me, everybody has an opportunity to build a life upon a rock. And you might say, but preacher, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. But preacher, I don't know the Bible like you do. Here's the thing. Jesus on this particular day, what is it, the 19th of July. Boy, how times are flying. 2020, He is issuing an invitation to all. You can build your house on the rock. There's no stipulation. It's not about grace. It's not about your particular upbringing. It's not about, um, you know, your traditions. Many people today say, well, I go to church because I was brought up going to church. If that's the only reason you go to church, friend, there's got to be more. There's got to be more. Jesus is saying, come to me, all ye. He's saying, the whosoever can build a life. There's every single person in this room. I'm grateful that we live in America. The land of the free because of the brave. We live in a land of great opportunity. We live in a land where anybody can do anything they put their mind to. But friend, 
I want to tell you, it's not because we're Americans, but it's because Jesus issued an invitation. Whosoever can, listen, you can go to the poorest place on earth and you will find people building their house upon a rock. The Lord is no respecter of persons. Both the wise and the foolish had an opportunity to build their house. Some of our young men and young ladies here, you have an opportunity to build your life upon the rock. Now, when you graduate high school, many of you will go to college, and you're going to major in hogwash and minor in baloney, and you're going to be taught all kind of things, and they're going to try to strip you of all of your values and the very virtues upon which you built your life up to this point. And there'll be more damage done in the first six months of your academic or, or collegiate experience. You better make sure when you check into your door that you've got a solid foundation upon which you're going to build your life. Prof Professor Finley Dink is going to come in there with his blasting tools and try to dismantle everything that you have built up into that point. Whenever that happens, you stand to your feet. You look the enemy in the eye and say, No, sir. No, ma'am. I am a whosoever. And the Lord Jesus Christ invited little old me where I was and who I was to build my house upon a rock. Because the Savior is no respect of persons. Number two. Storms are no respect of persons. Storms are no respecter of persons. Friend, did you know when you read this text that you will see as our little angel Gabriel has shared with us this morning that the rains come on the house of the wise man and the foolish man. So we need to be very clear when the rains come, don't panic. And say, but God, I thought I had built my house right. Oh, you built it right. In fact, the reason we build our house right is not so that storms won't come, but because the storms will come. My little house ain't much. You drive by, by my little old house, I have been so proud of anything in all of my life. I'm telling you what, you couldn't make a down payment on the scheme. I'll take what my little house costs, but anyway. But if you strip back that vinyl siding, you'll find down in there a little old cinder block house that was built back yonder when they built houses. And if you dig a little bit deeper, you'll find it's on a concrete slab. It's, I don't know it's about that deep. I couldn't find the bottom of it. And up underneath it's the most solid little piece of earth around White Lake, the highest point around all the lakes, 66 Azalea Lake. And we hunker down in that house every once in a while when a storm comes. And I said, baby, aren't you glad we're living in a cinder block house with a concrete foundation? And that house don't sway. It don't shudder. It don't rock. It just stands there fast and strong. Why? Not because it was built hoping the storms would never come, but because it was built knowing the storms would come. How is your house holding up? There's a whole lot of pastors out there that I know that are absolutely broken hearted. Ministers that are overwhelmed. And I want to tell you, I find it every day. I'm thankful for every single one of y'all. I'm thankful for all of y'all watching on Facebook as well. But I want to tell you, I like it better when there's 400 people packed in this building out. I like it better when the overflow is overflowing. But I want to tell you, for over seven years, God has built a house on the shores of White Lake. And it not only is going to weather this storm, I believe God's going to use this storm to even strengthen us and encourage us. And whether the storm lasts six more months, six more years, or until
until Jesus comes. I'm thankful to know it's not up to me to hold this house together. But it's up to the very one whose death and, and resurrection birthed this church. I'm thankful to know that for 2,000 years we've been claiming the promise. Upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell and the storms of life and the viruses that come would not be able to even harm it. One single bit. For a hundred years, Noah built a boat. He didn't build that boat because there wasn't a storm a coming, but he built that boat because God said, there's a storm on the way. Not one drop of rain penetrated that old boat. Not one life was lost. Can you imagine? As they came to rest on top of Mount Ararat, and they looked out on the other side of the flood and said, look at all of God's mercy that He spared us, and now He's given us a new day to serve Him. Well, I need to move quickly as we close. There's the requirements of our Lord. There's the reality of our lives. The storms are coming. Say, preacher, if another storm comes. I heard it said this week, said, can y'all imagine? Last year on December the 31st, half of us stayed up and celebrated 2020 was here. Can you imagine the celebration when this one goes out? Storms are coming. Number three. Let me just stop here and say, listen, don't y'all do anything to get yourselves in any storms. Amen? Some storms are going to happen. God providentially allows some storms, but don't blame God on every storm that comes. Some of them we get ourselves in. Oh, I pray to God that our nation wouldn't get ourselves in a bigger storm than we're in. Move on. Number three. The results of our labor... The results of our labor. Jesus said, listen, you've got to build a house. Sometimes we have this idea that Christianity is about rewarding laziness. God, you said you'd build a church, so you go ahead. Let us know when you got it done. We'll move in. No, Jesus said that you've got a choice. The wise man had a choice. The foolish man had a choice. One made the right choice. The other made the wrong choice. But they both were builders. So here's the result of our labor. Psalm 127. Verse 1. We talked about this last week. Listen. Except the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keeps the city, the watchman watches in vain. We need to make sure that the house that we are building is being built according to the design, the blueprint, the specifications, the requirements, and the codes of King Jesus. Amen? We don't have a whole lot of committees and a whole lot of bureaucracy, praise God. Whatever's been built, God's built it. Whatever's happened, God's done it. But we could get together. And we could form a hundred committees and a hundred one committee would be a committee on committees. And we could build a building and we could establish a ministry and we could develop a mission. But unless God's in it and He's directing it, then I want to tell you, I don't want to be in the good ship grace unless the Lord is the captain of that ship. Because any place that we might take it would be bound for a fate worse than the Titanic ever knew. Well, here we go. Number one, the results of our labor. The solid foundation was not shaken. Luke's Gospel says it so beautifully. Luke chapter 6, verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, but you don't do the things I say? Whosoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you who he is like. Here it is. He is like a man who built a house. He did deep all the doctrine that we need, y'all. No more eating cotton candy. No more sipping on milk of babes, but some meat, some doctrine. And he laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose and the stream beat vehemently upon that house, it could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. There's not a single church split, not a single division of a denomination, not a single issue in the house of God that could not have 
been prevented, avoided, and absolutely eradicated from the even spectrum of possibility if the church would have just made sure that every block that was laid was laid upon the solid foundation of the Word and the will of God. Amen? Oh my! And there's not a division ahead that cannot be prevented by making sure. Listen, when you go to build a house or a building or a church, you're constantly going back to the blueprints. You don't just look at it one time and say, we got it, let's go. But you're constantly coming back and evaluating and assessing every step by the master plan. Number two. Best part yet, don't miss this. There's the solid foundation, but there's also the sinking foundation. Verse 49 of Luke 6. But he that heareth and doeth not is like the man that is without a foundation. He built upon the earth. Ah. Oh. He built upon the earth. I'm amazed how many people love Mother Nature and deny Father God. This text talks about the fools. If you walked out on top of a mountain and you looked down at the grandeur of the valley below, a wise man would say, Ah, someone created this. Just like if you walked into New York City and looked at the skyscrapers and said, Wow, somebody created this and only a fool would deny either. Well, Matthew 7, 27 says, Great was the fall of it. Let me give you this option. When we think about the sinking foundation, there are two options, two reasons why the foundation did not hold. And by the way, the bigger, listen, the bigger you try to build a ministry, the more elaborate you try to build your life, the more difficulty you will have sustaining it if it's not on the right foundation. You better get it right. Why? Number one, because of shifting sand. You'll give me four more minutes, we'll be done. Don't miss this. Shifting sand. Now what is that? That's when there's no consistency. That's when it's always moving around. That's what man's wisdom is. Now, I'm not an anti-scientific kind of person, but there's a whole lot of lies being told out there. Friend, here's the deal. Some of you are a little bit older than me, and if you would go back and get your high school science book and bring it next Sunday, and I'll go get my high school science book from the early 90s, and some of you that are in high school, now, you bring your science book, we'll compare them. Almost nothing is the same. Almost nothing. Why? Because even science is shifting. Right? Everything that we know is shifting down here on earth. We need to make sure we're not building on anything that changes, but on the one thing that has never nor will ever change. This is the only eternal thing you own. And by the way, hear this. This is the only thing today that makes sense. Friend, I want to tell you, if I ever doubted this word, I do not now. Not because of all the glorious things that it tells me, but because of just the absolute clear picture, the plain picture that it paints of what would happen even now. I don't even know what epidemic death was when I noted about 25 years ago that in the last days there would be pestilence, which means epidemic death. But I understand it now. I didn't understand what it meant when it said men would do what was right in their own eyes. But I understand it now. I didn't understand how a person couldn't go into a shop without the mark of the beast on them and buy, and buy merchandise. Oh, but today I do, friend. Let me go on and tell you there's a good chance that with the corona vaccine is going to come an opportunity for a test trial for the mark. And if you take that vaccine, they're going to place a chip or some other kind of identifying marker in you. Friend, I want to tell you, this old book said it would happen and it's getting clearer and clearer and clearer every single day. Why? Because this is not shifting sand. This is the eternal truth of Almighty God. And you say, don't you think that makes you old-fashioned? Old friend, I want to tell you, if it's old-fashioned to believe in the God of heaven, then call me what you will. But this is the only thing today.
today that we can build a life on. And tomorrow, and the next day, and next year, and until Jesus comes, we'll say, Aha, uh -huh. I see it. I get it. I trust it more every single day. Number two, not only shifting sand, but sinking sand. And that's when the foundation just fails. It just washes away. Did you know that many beaches today are disappearing? Many beaches today are just disappearing. Why? They call it receding shorelines. Waterfront houses are now gone and the second row is now waterfront. Probably a good place to put your money, a second row house, because the beaches are receding. And many churches today are disappearing. Oh man, this is good stuff. It's right here in the Word of God, but we're about out. Here we go. About out of time. Churches are disappearing because of a receding shoreline. They kept saying, oh, well, you know, these are different days. Things are changing. Times are different. And the shoreline keeps moving further and further away from the inerrancy and infallibility and the inspiration of Scripture. Friend, I want to tell you, these are desperate days. And if ever the church needed to be fervent and faithful, it is now. Let's close. Verses 28 29. And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at His doctrine. Oh, may God give us an awe for His stuff. For He taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. I don't know your media outlets and where you get your information from, but I promise you every one of them is shifting and sinking sand. It doesn't matter how conservative or liberal it is, it's temporarily correct at best. The news today will be de debunked and disproved tomorrow. But the Word of God, oh friend, listen, only Jesus has authority over your life and my life. Only He has authority over His church. Usurping any authority for our gain or for our governance will lead to certain disaster. So today I just want to ask you, will you and will I submit to the doctrine of the Lord? That is the truth of Scripture. When Jesus said, upon this rock, He said, this is true, this is my doctrine. Will we, not as a matter of creed, but as a matter of allegiance and obedience, say, God, we agree with Your Word. Number two, will we submit to His authority? Now, I know in the 21st century, we like to say, well, ain't nobody going to tell me what to do. Friend, I want to tell you, there's never been a day in my life that somebody wouldn't tell me what to do. But I'm thankful that the one who tells me what to do knows the end from the beginning. He knows what's best for me. He knows every hair of my head. No comments, please. He knows everything that is ahead of me, everything that's behind me. Listen, I can trust Him. I can, I'm going to submit to somebody's authority. I want to make sure that the very one that I'm submitting to is the King of all ages. Wow. How about it? Number one, are you saved? You can't build it until you've first been born again. And secondly, you're building a life. We're building a church. You're building a family, a business, on and on and on. What are you building on? For the wise man built his house upon a rock. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The storm came to both houses. One stood firm and one fell down. There's so many implications and applications for this text. For the life of the individual, for the life of the church, and I would submit to you for the life of our very nation. Father, thank you for the rock, the rock of ages cleft for me. Thank you that you give us yourself to build a life upon. God, there are less people today 
who are taking this challenge of Scripture seriously. Or even those that attend church somehow believe that we're doing you a favor as we check off yet another box. But God, you have called us to salvation, sanctification, and then to a building program to do kingdom work. Lord, I've only got one life to live. Every person under the sound of my voice has only one life to live. And God, there's only one Lake Church and only one White Lake Christian camp. And, and God, I pray that everything that we do personally and corporately would be consistent with Your Word. We want to be wise and not foolish. We want to build on a solid foundation and never on sinking sand. May we dig deep. May we build our lives upon the very one that gave his life so that we could. Lord God, have your will and way in this time of invitation in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet all over the house of God? I know if you're like me, you think, well, this means the service is over, but there's a decision. Right now and right here, there's a decision of salvation that desperately needs to be made in each of our lives. Once and for all, no more pretending, no more playing dress up. But God, I want to truly have an experience with you. And then the progression of sanctification of growing in you. But you're going to leave this place in just a couple of minutes. You're going to, you're going to log out on Facebook Live and, and, and go look at other people's posts to see what they did last night. But right now, every one of us is going to make a decision. Either we're going to keep on building, and maybe we're building on a solid foundation, and we just need to keep on doing what we're doing. Praise God. I hope that's the case. But others of us are at some point in this building program, personally and corporately. And we're going to say, God, today, I release this whole project to you. And I commit with every ounce of my strength and fiber of my being that I'm going to allow you to build my life, my house, my church, my business, my family, whatever. Right here, right now, draw a line in the sand. July the 19th, 2020, today, God takes over the building, the building program of my life. We're going to sing a song. And I know it's different. But if you feel led to come and pray, you do so. You can reach out to us later through text or through messenger. Don't let the devil snatch these seeds that have been sown. Don't let him knock. Listen, you know when the easiest point to knock over a building is? It's in those initial stages. You can go over and push a building over when it's first being built. Don't let him do it. Whatever's on your heart, let's do business with God. You don't need to do business with me. I'm glad you came. I love you to do that. Business directly to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Oh, what a thought this morning as we sing and as we respond personally to this invitation. Would you, would you come?
faith, the doctrine, and the depth. Listen, we look forward to all that God will do this week. I'll see you every day at sunrise. Don't forget young people tonight, 6 o'clock at the camp. Tomorrow, 7.30 at the camp. Uh, young people, some of y'all able body folks that are local uh, that can help us. Maybe you're not working or going to, to school or anything right now. Come out. It will be a blessing. I promise you to minister to these folks that are in need. We desperately need you. And then don't forget, next Sunday, God in country. Let me go ahead and say, I know uh, Yogi Berra said about one restaurant in New York. He said, ah, that place is so crowded, nobody goes there anymore. And I'm already hearing, you know, but I don't know if I'm going next week because there'll be so many people here. Well, sometimes that backfires. And uh, so we want to make sure we've got a great attendance to love old man and Alice and to honor uh, our nation's heroes. We'll be honoring veterans, our uh, police, fire, and EMT, and our public servants, our medical professionals. We're just going to make sure that we take a moment next week to do that well. So please join us, those on Facebook Live. Make sure to join us next Sunday. It's going to be a very, very, very special day. But as always, it won't quite be the same without you. God is good.